Hello, everybody, and welcome to Watches and Whiskey. Happy New Year to everybody. New edition, a couple of surprises for you. First and foremost, what do you think of the new set? A few of you guys said, hey, your set is kind of cheesy. There was some fake linoleum stuff in the back or whatever that was. I don't remember that our CMO, Ivy, decided to slap on it to turn the set white. We took all that off. Uh, the guys basically stole a bunch of shit from my office, and they put it all in here, and now looks better, doesn't it? Yeah. How do you feel? Do you feel like you're... No, I feel like you're about to collect a lot more garbage <laughs> than the long because well, your, your office is I got naked. Cartier clocks. I got Jaeger clocks. I got a padded clock up there. Come on now. But what they don't see is the garbage in your office. I mean, he's got and, all types and, of and stuff. We have, and we have proper liquor, which is... Yes, a, speaking of liquor, surprise liquor. number two, uh, Nick from Marketing said, for today's Watches of Whiskey, there's going to be a surprise. Oh, boy. So I feel like a homeless person, honestly, to be honest <laughs> with you. But let's see what this is. Okay, Nick, really? Some of our viewers say you actually uh, look like a homeless person. Hey, it's possible. High West Whiskey, American Prairie Bourbon. Bourbon. Okay, All well, right. I never had one of these, but... Let's crack it. Let's crack it. All right, so this has to go. And, of course, my blind ass can't see the perforated line. <laughs> Why are you looking at the time, Adrian? <laughs> the world's waiting, Roman. And too? here's the new set, bro. Oh. What's up? You shouldn't have. Do the honors? Sure. Cheers, everybody. Happy New Year again. What a better way to start with a nice glass of bourbon. By the way, I so overdid it in New Year's. We did a whiskey tasting, yeah. me and uh, Mike. Six different bottles. We started at 6 p.m. Uh, a couple other guys showed up around 9, 30, 10. The next morning, and they weren't heavy drinkers, the next morning we looked at the six bottles and in each bottle, at least half or more yeah. was gone. So the way I figured is I probably had a whole bottle to myself. Let, let's see what this bourbon is all about. It's got a kick. <coughs> no, this is good. This is good. And you know what? Surprisingly, surprisingly, for a straight bourbon, it still it's got has a it's got it's got still it has a sweet taste of a, of a, a rye. Little car caramel undertone. You taste that. Still all messed up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Corona boy. By the way, he had Corona a while back, and his taste his taste buzzing not the same. But Nick, thank you very much. This is really good, actually. Yes. All right. So, what's on the, what's on the topics today? Today we're going to talk a little bit about industry news, and more importantly, we're going to talk about the Paddock 1463R that was in an online auction at Christie, and it fetched six hundred thousand dollars. Why do we want to bring this up? We'll talk about the watch in a second, just the same. But what I did want to bring up is the fact that. A lot of stuff has moved to online, and it's weird because this is a high-ticket item. This is a very visible watch. This is a watch that you would never normally see go in an online auction. Online auctions, even for the bigger houses, usually reserved for some of those not-so-worthy pieces, as I should call them. Not to say that they're shitty watches that go into online auctions, but for the most part, a piece such as this deserves the limelight of a fancy room uh, in a hotel in Hong Kong or New York or Geneva or somewhere. This is usually what you see there. Uh, 1463, specifically rose gold, is an important watch. This is actually a Serpico one, which means it was retailed in Caracas by Serpico. It's Serpico Wileno, I believe, was the full name of the manufacturer. 1463R, right. it is? Uh, the 1463R. The rarest, uh, the, what makes it more rare is the, is the fact that it's rose gold. They made it in yellow. They made it in stainless steel. Rumored only 21 of these were made per year in total from like 1940 to 1965. This one is circa 1950s. They're saying approximately 140 pieces were made in total. Um, and I think only about 50 or 55 of them were actually identified. Uh, but again, the topic here is, again, is the fact that we, due to COVID, we've moved into this era where now uh, you can have these million dollar pieces go on an online auction and actually be successful. Uh, this watch actually was also sold at a March auction at Christie's. Not this very watch, same exact watch, but with a better dial. That fetched 700,000, this thing fetched 600,000, and the difference there is the dial. And you're not a big vintage guy. He never was. No, I don't I'd, think li I'd like to be. He'd though. like to be, but he never was. But so, but we happen to have a friend that we can FaceTime, yeah. right? So I'm gonna get a few more thoughts from someone that you guys have already met on my show, Adam Golden from Mental Watches. I'm gonna try to FaceTime real quick. Adam. Hey, what's up? What's up? I got, I got Adrian here. We're taping our episode. Uh, I briefly called you about this 1463 of Christie's that just fetched 600 in the online auctions. I wanted to get your brief thoughts on the watch itself, obviously, and you know, 
for you to talk about this whole online versus offline atmosphere of auctions and all these important pieces all of a sudden going for big money online in an online auction. Yeah, I mean, well, that 1463 that you're referring to is co-signed Serpico and Lino, which was a Venezuelan distributor, kind of like Tiffany & Co. Um, very important signature, uh, almost as close to Tiffany, but not quite. Um, so they bring a lot of more money. It was a pink gold reference, so it was probably, you know, 150K, 200K more than a regular non Serpico signed uh, 1463. But yeah, it brought a, a big number, especially for an online sale. And I know we talked about it. There was one that was sold early in the year for a little bit more money, like 110K more. It was like 7 uh, I think it fetched like a 7 11, something like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's what it did. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that watch, you know, listen, I didn't, haven't had a chance to inspect any of these in person, so I can't tell you what they actually were like. But based on the photos that Christie's provided, that watch sold for more money, all things being equal, because the condition was nice. Uh, if you look at just the clear, uh, you know, online photos, the dial was much nicer. The one that sold recently had a lot of patina on the dial. Still a nice watch, but that's why you see a price difference, you know, because obviously the better condition watch is always going to sell for more money. Um, but yeah, online sales, I've talked about this a lot online, and I think we've talked about it. They've been crushing it during the era of the pandemic. Um, I think there's a lot of factors at play here number one our normal course you know you and i as dealers our normal course of business uh, has been disrupted you know modes of doing business uh and because of that there's an inventory shortage you know i know with modern dealers especially with vintage dealers uh it's very very difficult to source new and fresh and quality pieces um so the good pieces that do come up sell for a lot of money just because there's nothing out there uh second of all Obviously, the pandemic has hurt a lot of people all across the globe. It's not just the United States. It's not just in Europe. It's everywhere. Um, but obviously, there are people who are prone to depressions, you know, or, or sorry, that, you know, are pr depression proof, so to speak. They have so much money, they don't really care. Uh, and that's why these bigger pieces sell for big money. You'd think during a pandemic or during a crisis, you know, the prices would drop, but we've seen the opposite of that. We've seen some pieces go up because the people who have that kind of money haven't really been affected by the pandemic likely, and they're competing for these coveted pieces that aren't really being offered to them as 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 often as they used to be because there's nothing going around right now because there's an inventory shortage. I got a, um, I got a question for you yeah, in that, res I mean, in that respect. A quick final thought. Go ahead. You know, I've talked to a lot of people at auction houses because I'm friends with a lot of them, Christy Sotheby's Antiquorum, and they're all telling me that the numbers of registered online users has higher than it's ever been, you know, prior to. Like, so their online sales are absolutely crushing it. Um, and, you know, it's maybe it's a fluke, maybe it's not. It's been going on all of 2020, so we'll have to see how it goes in 2021. Well, I know you're a busy guy. Just a quick question before you go. Sure. Uh, imagine if you did not know uh, what... Luck, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, imagine, imagine if you did not know what uh, this watch fetched, that this watch in the condition that it's in fetched $600,000. As a dealer, uh, where would you think you'd be a buyer on that watch? And do you think this watch went to a dealer or a private customer? Man, that's so hard to say. Uh, obviously, it's very dependent on what the watch looks like in person. Um, but here's the thing. Is, now we're talking about an online so auction, an important piece. of sale number, for sure. Um, it probably went to a private. Uh, it's possible a dealer bought it, you know, who had somebody in mind for it. I think it's a strong price for a dealer to pay. So obviously, if I were personally buying it, I would want it to be a little bit less than that, you know. Um, how much less? I don't know. Uh Maybe somewhere in the you know four fifty to five hundred. Well, that's range. that's that's, that's what I that's what I said. Fees, you know? But the so problem, but the problem for us as money. dealers, the problem for us as dealers right now is that uh, we have a very difficult time, especially you, because your vintage is your thing, is to buy stuff sight unseen. Before you go into auction room, you go into an inspection room, you get to inspect, you get to touch and feel, you get to loop the dial, you get to do all those things. Now here's an online auction. Don't you feel that something like this now deters the dealers and attract and and mainly the buyers now going to be the retail and buyer? Because I don't see myself putting in four fifty or five hundred thousand into that watch without at least looping that dial. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think you know I talk to a lot of other dealers, and especially with the auction season that just passed, I'm used to going into auction season. You know, whether it be in November, December, or, you know, May, whatever, and buying several watches. You know, I'm talking, you know, lot. Well, uh, quite a few washes from my inventory i think this past auction season november december i picked up you know i could count on one hand how many watches because the prices were just prohibitive and it was a sign of you know mostly retail buyers buying the watches not dealers 
Um, well, good, for, good for good for Christie's and auction houses, and bad for us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you know, I, I, I assume they're all doing their due diligence and getting great pictures from the auction houses, etc. Um, when I'm buying at auction, I'm very, very careful, uh, and it's obviously my money on the line, and I do a lot of business with them, so I try not to screw up, you know, so as not to hurt the relationship. Uh, and also, when I'm buying, I'm making sure I'm inspecting every piece, you know, in very uh, great detail because I'm passing them on to my client, you know, and I'm giving them warranties and representations. Um, so it's difficult without seeing these watches in person right now, especially as a dealer, to bid strongly at auction. I know if I could see the watches in person, and you know, obviously. If you've ever asked for pictures from an auction house, extra pictures, they all, part of my frame, can suck. Mm. Uh, so if you hit up Christie's or Sotheby's and say, hey, can I get extra pictures of, you know, lot 214? They'll send you extra pictures, but they're, they're horrible. They're yeah. really, and really bad. It's, yeah. not, it's not just so the auction houses. It's just dealers worldwide. It's, it's not just auction houses. Some dealers are the same way. Besides know? me. Yeah. It's, I send yeah. great Especially pictures. Especially when it comes to vintage. Adam, I want to thank you so much for taking the call. I appreciate it. I, I might see you in Florida actually in a few weeks. I'm going to go down there. Yeah, I think if I'm going to come down, I'm definitely come see you. Uh, we're going to go on with this episode. Thanks for coming on. Yep. Wish you were here physically. With This is Watches and Whiskey. We would have had a shot of whiskey with you, but cheers Thanks. to you. Happy New Year, bro. I'll talk to you. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye. So there you have it. It's funny, how, it's funny how he was describing the inventory shortage, whereas when I do the actual quantity of watches sold in 2020 was more than 2019 and 2018. 2018 was my best year ever. 2019 was actually a little bit slower. 2020, in terms of volume, I did more. But, but I think he's talking about... But you worked a lot harder to get those pieces. Um, and on some of the stuff, you, yes, have, to, you have to deal yes with shorter no. margins. Yes and But no. I think he was more specific about the vintage market, because vintage market, look, it's not... You can, you can, If you really wanted to go out there today and buy 100 Submariners, you could. I could. If, I, vintage, wanted to, if the, I wanted to go out and buy two of these, I couldn't. And that's just and that's really the difference. I think, I think, I think a lot of those pieces are, are coming out of... Well, there's a huge vintage market, not only in the United States, but in Europe as well. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, really a lot of the deals that we work with in the vintage market are in Europe, and they were just completely closed down. There was no trade going on in between. Yeah, they couldn't travel. They couldn't move. Traveling, yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's go on uh, to the next topic of conversation. I want to get your thoughts on this. According to GQ, here are the three chronograph watches collectors can't resist. Uh, in recent article, GQ writer Bern Clymer said, there are three chronographs that really matter. The Rolex Daytona, the Omega Speedmaster, and the Tag Heuer Carrera. That's not to say that others aren't great, but these three represent entire categories of collecting and scholarship onto themselves. Over the past seven decades, they have rightly reached a level of appreciation that in some cases surpass even the brands that produce them. The problem with this echelon of success is of course ubiquity. And off camera, because I'm an immigrant, we looked up ubiquity, that means common basically, right? Being everywhere more or less. Uh, every year, more chronographs are made. More really? people. It's because you're an immigrant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> every year, more chronographs are made. More people wear them and obsess over them. And suddenly, objects that were conceived as fully realized expressions of unique senses of design and function start feeling blasé. What are your thoughts? Well, let's start with the three essential chronographs. What, okay. would, you, what would be on your list? Daytona, first and foremost. I agree with the Daytona. Omega um, Speedmaster. I'm gonna, I'm sure. gonna agree. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna agree on Omega Speedmaster. So the Tech Heuer Carrera, not so much. Yeah, I wonder why he's, he used the Carrera first. The thing of it is, is they're talking about the last seven decades. And okay. if we're going back right. seven decades, I will agree with the three watches in the order that he put them. Rolex, most definitely Omega Speedmaster for sure. Tech Heuer Carrera also, although not as highly coveted or recognized as let's say that of the Speedmaster and the Rolex Daytona. Anybody who's a watch collector out there, Rolex Daytona is the Holy Grail Absolutely. chronograph. The Speedmaster is a must have. Just I think in terms of units produced over, over those decades, I mean there's so many Omega Speedmaster chronos and tag chronos and Daytona. And, and Daytonas as well. So the main point of this topic right, is they're talking about the fact that they become ubiquitous, right? The, they use the word ubiquity, which in layman's terms means very common and a lot of. Uh, I I'm wearing a chronograph and you're wearing a chronograph, which my, we'll talk about later. But with well. that, but with that said, they're talking about the fact that these things have become common. I don't think if 50 years ago or 60 years ago you had the same effect across those three watches, right? I think today the distance between the three has increased and increased tremendously. Since Tag Heuer was bought over and is no longer Tag Heuer, it's lost its appeal. Mass production, as you said, is the same. 
Omega Speedmaster, again, there's a sense of, oh my God, there's so many Omega Speedmasters out there. Mm -hmm. It's sort of losing its appeal just the same, yet it's not like there's a whole lot of less Rolex Daytonas out there. It's right. just they're a lot more coveted. So the one thing I will say is that, yes, there's, all of this stuff is everywhere today. The Tech Core chronographs, the Omega chronographs, as well as Rolex chronographs. But Rolex has separated itself from the bunch to a point where it, it's just not even close. That's, that's number one, right? But can I still say that Rolex Daytona is in that same realm uh, in terms of being common, in terms of there being a lot of them? Absolutely. 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 Another thing they're saying is every year more chronographs are made, more people wear them and obsess over them. I don't think that stands true for the last few years. I would disagree with you there. Well, look at the uh, uh, Plain Jane, Royal Oaks, and Nautiluses versus the Chronos. Yeah, but that, that, that's a little bit different of an argument there that you're having because the chronographs, although pretty much at a retail price point, they're a little bit more than Royal Oaks, and although the Royal Oaks are pretty much the same money as the Chronos, aesthetically, people love chronographs, whether they use them or not. It's still an actual functional... Nobody uses them. Uh, I do. I do use them. For? To check the watches when they come in. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's but it's an actual function that you can use, right? I was wearing a perpetual calendar over last week, and I never really thought that I would use it, but I actually did. I said it, said the moon phase, did the whole thing, and... Uh, Use the month, use the day, leap year indicator, the whole deal. You so really need I to really know did. what if it's leap year I, or not. I had to. I had to. I was like, oh man. <laughs> Is it because you were there over New Year's and that's kind of you figured, you know what? Well, plus I, I needed some good IG shots because the leap year indicator was on the market <laughs> that I wanted the day, day, month, and move If you want to talk about it was, it, was, it was a good IG content. If you want to talk about usage, okay? Yeah. Yes, chronographs were huge. If you go back 50 years, Again, watches in general were always a tool. And chronograph was probably the number one used tool Absolutely, in a yeah. watch period since the inception of watches. I think, moreover, people are obsessed with chronographs because I think that's the one complication that is absolutely, unmistakably recognized from far, from mean. near, and so on that's and so forth. I mean. You can instantly recognize a chronograph. Instant. You have the pushers, number one, mm -hmm. and you have the three sub dials. Well, mm -hmm. for most chronographs. Yeah. So, with people obsessing over chronographs, if, I'm not so sure if it's really due to the fact that there's such a demand for chronographs because people are obsessing them versus companies making chronographs, so many chronographs, because it's sort of that, you know, base complication, and it is a complication. Would you say that, would you say it's a diff difficult com complication to produce? A, a right kind of chronograph, yes. It is. It is so a difficult. Well, does it, for them to actually manufacture that chronograph and then put it out into market. It's whereas, prestigious. It, okay, well, yes, it's prestigious, but the price point difference that they're able to, to it's inject. Justi it's justified. It's justified. It is justified. So they make more money. Because of the chronograph function. Yes. There you go. Okay, let's see. Suddenly, objects that were conceived as fully realized expression of unique senses of design and function start feeling blasé. So I believe what he's referring to here is that there's just so many of those chronographs out there mm -hmm. that people are just sort of looking at them either as boring or as no big deal. In one of my past videos that I did and I talked about the chronograph, the chronograph is one of the most complicated complications in the watch out there to get it. Just because it's been that done that type of deal, yeah. it's still one of the most complicated things to get right because it is extremely, extremely difficult to properly manufacture a well done, accurate chronograph in a watch in a mechanical watch right be it auto automatic or not is irrelevant so but people are still looking past it like oh it's just another chronograph oh it's just another chronograph and i think this is where Bernard was going with this and i don't think we're ever going to get away from the fact where all of a sudden the chronograph is going to become that oh my god it's a chronograph rather than oh it's another chronograph what do you think unless we're talking I don't, about richard mill what do you mean because richard what? mill you know you know i think richard richard mill put chronograph back on the map when they did their uh, 004 when they're putting their chronographs out right now that are out there selling for three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, and it's just a chronograph. I think this is the only brand that mm. putting the spotlight back on a chronograph in a way it should be as a highly complicated. Well, they do market themselves as a racing machine on the wrist, hence chronograph was basically made for racing. Yeah, I guess so. you're right. Well, anyway, it's a good article if you guys get a chance. Uh, yep. it's, I think it's a pretty good read. Uh, here, they want us to talk about Grail watches. Grail watches. So, what was like your when you first thought about getting a fancy watch, what was that one grail watch? Timex, Mickey Mouse watch? No, Platinum Day Date. Platinum Day Date. It was a Platinum Day Date. I remember I was a big hip hop fan, so I remember Jay-Z had one. I actually had it as my... Aren't you still a big hip hop fan? I still am, okay. but obviously my taste has grown a little bit in terms oh, of watches. You got, you got most but it was, it was the, I, I call it the, the Blackout Daytona, Platinum Daytona with the with that black dial. I think I actually wore oh, it on the no, show You're before. talking about the Blackout Day Date with Daytona. I'm sorry. Yeah, correct me. The uh, Blackout Day Date. 
That's, that's, that, that's that blacked out with the black dog exactly. numbers. You can barely yep. read it. Yep. That was my grail at the time. Was never a fan of that. What's your grail today? And don't tell me it's the McLaren 720S. That's not, about my, watches. that's not my grail car either. But What's your grail car? What's my grail car? Um, it's got to be probably Bugatti Chiron. You're going to need a raise. <laughs> 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 All right, so what's your, what would your grail watch be today? I'm going to let you start with that. That's going to take me a little right, bit. I'm going to go with my first grail watch. And believe it or not, I mean, in general, I could say I wanted a watch. I wanted a Rolex, which was my, my first money watch, as I called it. But the grail watch at the time for me, and you're going to laugh at this, was a Frank Mueller King Conquistador chronograph on a stainless steel bracelet. <laughs> <No. laughs> I said you, you're going to laugh at this. But look, oh, I, know it sounds, I know it sounds pretty bad, but you have to, you have, it's all about the time. It's still your grail but, watch? No, uh, <laughs> that was my first Grail watch that I couldn't afford at the time. Those things were selling for like thirteen or fourteen thousand. Now we're going back twenty, almost twenty-five years at the time where Frank Mueller was like the hottest thing out there, and the King Conquistador was the watch to have. Right? We're talking about a watch at the time retail probably for fifteen, sixteen thousand that were selling for eleven to twelve thousand dollars. Now that watch, at the time, just let me paint a picture for you. All right, paint it. It's Please. The newly released Lexus GS three hundred. Oh, that was before my time, man. Yeah, I know. The, the, as, the, the, as all the all the Russians, all the Russians had thank e you. Nissan Max, thank you. Nissan Max. Well, was, Nissan they, Max. They were raining Nissan Max. Yeah, Nissan Maximas were raining on the Russian community. So Nissan Maxima was and then a good car to have, but a, a Lexus GS, not the four hundred. Four hundred was too expensive. But the Lexus GS three hundred, which was like this new sporty coupe that just came out, which was basically a Maxima yeah, steroids. My dad, my dad had one. I remember back in the day. It was that gold one. And if you had that. Oh, yeah. And you had the Frank Miller King Conquistador, That's along it. with sunglasses from Cartier. Or Versace. With Versace? You can't spell Versace. Fosace. F O Sachi. It was the Cartier sunglasses, right? That had the gold frame with, with and the rest of it was wood. And stuff. they were lined up at the Russian supermarket <laughs> with food stamps. No, not me. <laughs> and, 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 of course, a closet full of Versace. So this is the time oh, I just took you back to. Back then, that Frank Mueller King Conquistador, that was it. I mean, it was... You yeah, you walk it. out with that on your wrist, mm. you, panties wrap. What, what what's it now to walk with your wrist? Okay. On your now wrist. Today, now I'm today. a little more sophisticated. I'm a little <laughs> bit older. I don't have a lot. I don't have any Versace in my closet anymore. You're discerned. And man. I never did have that Lexus GS 300. I ended up going a little bit cheaper, and my first fancy car was a BMW 323. At the time, they had a BMW 325, and then they came out with a little bit of a cheaper version. It was a 323. That Damn, was my man. first fancy car. But you couldn't like change out that number, put a five on there. Today, <laughs> holy grail for you. I'm gonna probably have to go with the uh, RM 2701. I think that it's just freaking perfect. <laughs> To put it in, first off, the weight of the watch is just insane. It's just this is really good, man. Shout out to Dave. Yeah. Um, I just think it's aesthetically beautiful. Like I've mentioned before, the Rafael Nadal series of watches are my favorite Richard Mille. Well, you're a Nadal fan too. I am a Nadal fan. Yes, to I'm a big Nadal fan. But I also I, I think that his watches are the best looking Richard Mille's on the market. I agree. I actually, I actually looked at the last one that came out. At first, I thought it was kind of ugly, but then it grew on me. I kind of with the I, tennis net. Yeah, I really yeah. like that one too. It actually, really, really. I grew like on me every the single one, especially and including the Ronald, the Ronald McDonald one. Ronald, I'll take not, it. not, not a fan. Um, mm, sorry. Uh, my holy grail watch is actually very simple. It's the Patek Philippe Sky Monterbia, not the new one, but the older version, the one prior to that, the five zero zero two, which we're trying to purchase right now. <laughs> and if we do. I'm still not in the position to keep it. We're going to have to resell it. Uh, anyway, so that was fun. Uh, here's a really, really good topic, and I know you had a lot to say about this. Google shopping price gaps. So mm -hmm. just general online shopping price mm -hmm. gaps. A lot of you guys, your consumer confidence is always shook when you shop online and you see an item, same exact item, that sells with a disparity of 30 to 40, sometimes 50% in price, which is pretty insane if you think about it. And all that does is chase consumer confidence. And right now, if you go on Google or Google Shopping and you put an A watch, I'm gonna, I'm, I just, what are you gonna I, go with? I just did it right now. And it, but before we even talk about it, it's funny that we're in a very, very interesting market in terms of pricing because I don't know any other market out there, and people, people correct me if I'm wrong, where there is such a disparity in prices on an item. If you car shop, if you sneaker shop, any type of shopping for the same comp, same item, you're never gonna get that disparity. And why is that? Why? Why is because the market we're in today, there are so many brokers in between. And the reason for this price disparity is because people post stuff online that they do not have. They wait for the customer to come, they fish them in, and then they see if they can fill that sale. 
right? All, all you really have to do is close the deal, send the shipping label to the next guy that has it. And I see this happen on a daily basis. And actually, yesterday, I saw somebody looking for a wash. I'm not going to mention what it was, looking to buy the CERN wash. And this is a guy that has everything under the sun on Chrono24. So the prices you started getting were much higher than what he had listed on Chrono24. And what happens is our market moves so quickly, especially now, month, weekly, monthly, whatever the case may be, that if you don't go back on your Chrono24 account, if you don't go back on your eBay account or whatever portal you use to sell your watches, you might be too cheap. But there's also people out there who put stuff up very high so they can fill that order so they can negotiate the price so they can take a credit card so they can ship it and insure it so that's where you see the price uh, disparity so and you said you said exactly what i briefly discussed before in some of my previous episodes that is exactly that yeah. now having started from that particular model and still using that model till this day i was never afraid i, I never hid the fact that we do some of that just the same because we can't stock every single watch this is how luxury bazaar started i started with a full catalog of every single watch under the sun and people would call me and uh, hey, can I get this watch? Sure, let me call the distributor, find out delivery time, work out a price and so on and so forth. And long story short, I would fulfill that order. As time went by, my, our business grew, I got more watches in stock and right now, yes, we have a fair share of watches we don't have in stock and we have a fair share of watches that we do have in stock, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to keep up with that model in uh, times like these because you literally have watches going up in price daily hourly over it it seems like seems like every minute so it's very hard to keep up if you're gonna put a catalog out there of a thousand pieces it's gonna make your life a lot difficult here's the one thing that we don't do and this is what separates us from the rest the only place that we utilize the model to fulfill orders is on our website you will never if you go to Corona 24 if you go to eBay if you go to any other 10 platforms that we sell on you're only going to see stuff that we have in stock and the reason for that is because if somebody comes to my website and it says hey Here's the swatch. I can always go back and say, listen, old listing, and tell people how it is. Listen, I can no longer deliver that watch at this price. The market has shifted. I can now deliver it for $500 more or $500 less. It doesn't mean anything, right? Because people call, find out, best price, this, that, and the other, right? If I put an auction up on eBay, if I put something up on Chrono 24, and I forget about it, and the market has just shifted 20%, and you know, if we're working on margins that are 10%, it's going to kill you, right? People are going to click buy it now. And it, it's happened to us before on our website where we, yeah. we uh, price something, something price was so low we completely forgot about something where people click buy now and then we had to apologize and not fill that order because we mm -hmm. physically couldn't. Sometimes we have filled orders and lost money just to fill that order if it was even close. Right. So, uh, yes, it's, this is also, also the reason why I tell people when they want to sell us something, right? And, you know, they see a watch on Corona 24 for 70000 and I offer them 60, they're like, well, wait a minute, this is on Chrono for 70, I should be able to get at least 65, 66, and I tell them, well, that individual doesn't even have that watch. That's why I always say the prices online are slightly inflated. Yeah, it's, let's, it's, look, it's, let's look at some examples. All right, so just off the top of my head, I decided to pull up a 5711 blue dial. Now, if I go just into Google Shopping. Well, let's look, let's look at the ads first. Ads, you have 83,000. 83,000. 73,000 and 73,000, but those are from the same seller because right. that's an eBay listing and a watch which, listing. Which, which is fine. So you have three different listings here, one for 83,000 that could simply just be in Europe somewhere. It's watchfinder.com. Who's okay. that? Okay, watchfinder.com. But, but they're based out of UK, but they have a US dollar sign. Obviously, prices over there are a little bit more expensive. Fine. Let's say that $83,000 watch, although more on the higher side, it's a complete set from 2019. And then the next watch, from Watchbox is 73,000. I don't know the details behind the watch, Click but- Click on it. Let's see. Does not say the year of the watch, however, on this one, but that's okay. So that disparity, I, I can see happening. Okay. But when you, when you go through and you see a lot of these brand new ones, you have one listing for 75,000 for what they're posting is a brand new watch. I mean, if I had to go out and find that watch, I doubt, first off, I doubt that they have it in stock. I know they don't, I know who exactly. that is. We're not so, gonna mention names. Uh, if I had to go out and find that watch, brand new, take a credit card, do the whole deal, there's no way I'd be able to fulfill this order. The next one you have is 86,000, which is on the high side. I don't see anybody paying 86,000 for a brand new 5711. And here so we there's, are. there's a perfect example. And here we are at 82,000. 82, can we fill that order? At 82,000, we can fill that order. So let's be transparent. If today on a call, we actually just sold the 57, but it was pre-owned. But mm -hmm. today on a call, you have to fill that order at $82,000. How much are you paying for a brand spanking new one? 
it's probably going to cost me seventy eight, seventy nine thousand. So the more again, the margin on there, it's it's okay because we didn't invest anything into that product. We fill the order, make the customer happy, make the supplier happy. But here, if you scroll down a little bit, you have a listing here for forty eight nine five five. <laughs> now that could be the oldest fifty seven eleven Nautilus miss, missing every link box paper possible. But there's no way that that watch is up there. And I've seen, I would probably pay forty eight thousand for just the head. I've seen the watch. I've seen this watch up there for a year already. You would think, why doesn't this seller? Remove it. I mean, I can't imagine how many calls they get for that for forty nine thousand. I can't imagine how people click, 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 check. And then out right it. next to it, you have one for ninety thousand five hundred seventy nine dollars. And I guarantee you that. And that same company has one up for fifty two as well. Same company, yeah. Not going to mention any names here, but <laughs> yeah. So that's that's one indicator of. But don't you think at this point the online consumer or the online sh watch shopper they today, shop around? No, but don't you think that at this point. They already understand. Like, no. if, this was, if this was five years ago, if this was ten years ago, fifteen years ago, these people would jump on and try to buy it, mm -hmm. right? But now, today, I don't think I don't think an average, well, not average. I don't think pretty much every shopper that's out there today shopping for watches is going to come across that listing at fifty-two thousand dollars, and they won't pay attention to it because they know yeah, that this listen, is not real. Yeah, maybe a majority won't, but somebody will. I might, I might contact them and be like, "What's up? Can I give you another one?" Yeah. Let's do the Rolex Green Daytona. How about that? So the one one six uh, what five zero eight. All right. Great so this example. is ads. All right. Ads. So oh, you got the ads. Well, that one that's for thirty eight thousand. It's a custom custom dial. It's not, it's not original. Another one that's custom dial unoriginal. Now so when you ads. say custom dials, all they did meaning is meaning it's a yellow gold. Probably most likely an older yellow gold Daytona that they put a aftermarket, aftermarket green dial. dial. But hold on, even at that price, the aftermarket dial is worth is nothing. It's a couple hundred bucks, right. but. The a yellow gold Daytona pre-owned today. That model, what does that go for today? It's probably a real. It's probably a one one six five two three, like an older model. Maybe uh, they want to do that to a Zenith, but yeah, it's probably an older one. I and maybe you. they don't have it in stock. You know. All right, um, let's go. What do you got? So well, first of all, we have one today. Yes. How much are we selling that for, brand new? Fifty-seven thousand. Fifty-seven thousand, brand new. Brand new. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's look at the pricing. So, one guy has for fifty-seven thousand online. I would bet you he does not have that. You know him. Um, I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> and then we have one all the way to the, to, to the far right. Watch Rapport again for $40,000. Obviously, they don't have it. What's your, this is that same? The this same one. This is the $43,000 5711, and they have a $40,000 green. I mean, on, honestly, that's yeah. and then, hold on, but the, right, there's one right next to it for how much? 60, 61. 61,000. Okay. So that's doable. Okay. Whether they have it or not, maybe they can fill that order. Well, listen, if, if, if we're selling ours for how much? We have it right there, Luxury Bazaar, 58995. 58995. When in reality, customer calls, we sell it for how much? Well, we watch like that, we would take, with the bank wire payment, you know, 3% off the top, so okay. whatever the math works. So let's say 58,000. Right. Okay. So the guy that has it up there for 61, he can buy it from us for 58 and fill the order. But who, who is this watch rap report? Is it report? report? Watch it's definitely it's not that report. It's, it's some marketplace that has prices all over the place. And actually, what they do is they kind of chrono twenty four it. They actually take other dealers' listings. I've had like I've called some dealers that are listed on there. I'm like, bro, do you have this watch for this price? They're like, dude, I haven't had this watch in years. You know, they like extract old listings. Oh, so they scrape the website. They, they right. scrape websites basically and put prices from God knows when. They're all over the place here on and, Google. But they're everywhere. I mean, everywhere. StockX used. Green dial Daytona, sixty-eight thousand. I mean, who on StockX would buy a green Daytona? Nobody. And stock, we do sell on StockX, but do we? Like, do we do yeah. all on StockX? We sell, stuff? we sell some of the cheaper stuff, and even with that, we don't do also all that well. Is because what happens is you get a bunch of low ball bids on it, and that's about it. And people list higher because of the fees again. So basically, nevertheless, not to cover too much more time on this, is watch prices are pretty much the green Daytona actually not so bad. But I've I've done research. No, I mean, you, got, you, you, you got from from forty thousand to sixty eight thousand. But, but I've seen a lot. But I've seen a lot worse for other models, which we're not going to cover right now. But basically, what we're trying to say is that the w online watch market, as successful as we are with it, and, and a lot of other vendors are, it's so incredibly inconsistent. And as a matter of fact, the biggest watch marketplace in the world, Chrono Twenty Four, we don't really do much business on there. As a matter of fact, I, sp I speak to a lot of my, my fellow colleagues and, and dealers, and they don't either. And it, it just it goes to show that at the end of the day, you want to do business, your own customer base. The biggest is issue Chrono24 has with. is just that. It's, it's prices that are all across the board. It's people listing things that they do not have. And uh, people using that platform mainly for marketing and advertising. You put a few yeah. listings up there, you get your Fish. name out there. Uh, people find you, they find who you are, they go to your website and things of that nature. It happens to us just the same. Mm -hmm. I was uh, in New York 
well, it's been a while back, this is pre-pandemic times, I had a meeting uh, with the owner of firstdibs.com, probably the more and biggest successful jewelry platforms out there. Obviously, firstdibs.com was more known for furniture. This is how they started, mid-century modern furniture, uh, accessories, high-end art, and things of that nature, and they slowly moved into the jewelry business. Uh, we were one of their first accounts, we became friendly, and I have an open door to the owner of the company. So once a year, once every two years, we'll get together just to shoot. And one of the things I had a conversation with him about is just that. They are a very uh, customer oriented. <laughs> what would you find? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. I had to, I had to, <laughs> I put Richard Mill RM11, their bread and butter, there's Kr one, there's, there's on there. So before, before we get to, what, what is this called? This is called a men's luxury watch, Richard Mill RM11, Felipe Massa, sold by Bonanza Oil Luxury Watches for $400. <laughs> Sold, <laughs> and then you go up and you have somebody selling an Arm Eleven or Three McLaren for two 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 hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. I call bullshit on that. Sold. Maybe we should contact them. Who is that? I know who that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Call them. I want to buy it. Yeah. Anyway, so was a, the conversation uh, went this way, and I told them. I said, David, I said one of the biggest issues you have in here is since the market is kind of blown up, you have all these dealers selling the same exact thing for a completely different price. And I, and I told them, I said, one of the things you should put in place is you should A, bet the dealers, number one, which they do. But at the same token, you should bet pricing and listings. And I know it's a lot, uh, it's easier said than done with thousands and thousands and thousands of listings, but I told them simple. I mean, look at your top 50 products. Take a look at your uh, top 50 products that say, let's say Cartier Love Bracelet, right? If you have the same exact Cartier Love Bracelet listed 100 times over, which you do, everybody loves Cartier Love Bracelets, we'll list them by the dozens just the same. But if you have 10, 10 of the same bracelets and the price variant is anywhere from 10 to 50%, perhaps that's a time where you reach out to that dealer and say, look, I think your price is either too high or too low, something is up. And, yes. uh, you know, I think that eventually Google Shopping, for say, as big of a giant as they are and as big of a uh, IT join as they are, they have the ability to do that. So that just to get rid of this, like if, if you have a thousand listings of the same exact product that has a SKU or reference number or something like that out there with again, an average the, price of let's say fifty eight thousand dollars. Google at the end of the day, as smart as it is, the, the machine that it is, it still doesn't really know the market. So it's, it it's, doesn't call it, it, it Google doesn't affect when you, when We upload products to the Google Shopping. When we right. upload products in the Google Shopping, there is some kind of an identify an, an, an identification number, be it a UPC code, be it a reference number, what it is. It's very easy for Google to go in and say, look, think, every UPC here, you know, I take out a million products under the same UPC and the average price is $10. If you see one for five or 20, something. Well, what if I want to sell that, that, that product for $5? I want to sell it for $5, whatever the price may be. Yeah, I guess you, you know, At the end of the day, I think it's up to the I guess, it's it's up, be, I guess it would be task impossible. But nevertheless, disparities online cause only one thing and it causes the fact that consumers tend to lose confidence in a particular product, which is why, you know, our goal has always been the same. You know, majority of our business is return clients, it's, right? It's, again, it's, it's, it's the, the gray market dealers. Gray market dealers are probably to blame for- Oh, absolutely. For prices being absolutely. where they are. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, wrist check, what do you got? I have the black themes on the wrist. The, the old 42 millimeter on a horn back strap and stainless steel. I you think know what? This, I think this is an absolute sleeper. This is probably one of the best looking steel offshores that they ever made. Oh, you just took the words out of my mouth. Because I, well, I talked about these things being sleepers. Really like I, did, I, did a, I did a whole I actually episode. never wore this before up, up until today, and I really, really like it. It's just clean. Like, I, real think, nice. I think that the themes dial, after the older yep. dials prior to this, till today is probably the best looking dial. What happened yes. was is that as, you know, over the years you continue making your offshore chronograph, uh, which is seemingly the same exact watch. There's only, there's only so creative you can get with it, and I think Lately, companies, including AP, have been getting overly creative. I think that is probably indeed the best looking. The black themes dial yeah. on an offshore is probably still the best looking dial as far as I'm concerned. I am wearing a also an AP, and I'm wearing a Royal Oak, except... So subtle. Uh, yeah, very subtle. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm little, actually... A little bit bigger. I've been wrist, working out but, uh, for the last few days. I, <laughs> I taped an episode of What's on My Desk, uh, and... Uh, you lost I, weight in your wrist? Uh, yeah. I taped an episode of What's on My Desk with the Royal Oak Grand Comp. One just fetched 411000 in auction, the one with the salmon dial. That's, that's your dial. Uh, I don't think dials make a oh, difference. It's very, but, it's but very, that's, very grailable. It's, me, you know it, I mean? is, it, is a gra it is indeed a grail watch, and I think for most people this would be a grail, a grail watch. If you're a royal I oak, think we just made up a term. Grailable. Grailable. How would you spell that? Grailable. G-R-A-I-L-A-B-L-E. Grailable. Yeah. Like, I, I remember making up the term Googleable. Grailable. I like grailable. I like Googleable. When I did the, when I met with the producer Michael, and when I went out to LA, when I did the video yeah. with him, you know, I, I, that's what I said. I said he's Googleable. Yeah, you can, you can Google him. You can see what his achievements are. Uh, you know, you made it if you're Googleable. 
True. Uh, <laughs> let's Google Adrian. Actually, everybody's pretty much Google at this point. Let's right see. Armed robbery and evasion. <laughs> what? No, that's not you. I'm sorry. Got that expunged. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> that picture. Hi, Jersey Short. What's up? Oh, back in the day. look at that. <laughs> the hairline is a bit higher. I'm Shut up. Lower. I must say. I take. I take offense to that. You are a stud. <laughs> look at you. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, oh, Ian. I'm gonna text you these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, uh, Grand Comp, again, yes. I, last my episode I said, you know, it takes four days to get used to any watch, and I've been wearing this for a few days, and it's tough. This sucker is heavy as hell. I think it's just but never, too never, big never on But definitely grailable. Grailable. Gra grailable, that's it. All right, we got a video reaction we got to talk about, and that video reaction is going to be Bobby, no, Robbie. I need my glasses for this. Robbie Anderson shows off his insane jewelry collection on the Rocks GQ Sport. He has a few APs. He talks about how the price has raised through the pandemic, even though one is busted down. New York Jets wide receiver. Not a fan of the Jets, obviously, Who but is? let's see this video. Can, guys, can we please get a laptop? Oh, man. I really like my AP a lot. Oh. We just did some surgery to it. Add his can we get Nico in here? <laughs> can we get Nico in here, please? Money down the drain. Bullshit. I'll say, man, it's it's actually rare when they show a bust down in one of these videos that I like, like <laughs> that I don't like, that like, you don't really, like. like really don't like, and that's got to be one. Some emeralds. I just really like. I didn't want to bust down the the face because I just really was into the blue dial. Yeah, on thank it. you for small Thought favors. It was dope and different. And the crazy thing about this watch during the pandemic is added a lot of value because you know I guess. Let's talk about value. So let's take a blue dial Royal Oak chronograph two years is ago. That, is that gold? I don't yeah, know it's gold. It's gold. It's gold. It's not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Oh. There's there's yellowing. No, look, 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 look. It's it's got the steel sub dials. I think they added these are baguettes, and they added they put a yellow bezel in, in them, and they put a yellow bezel. This is a stainless steel watch. Are you sure? Let's look at it again. Really you like see some places? AP. Look, that bezel is gold. Yeah. Right. Let's see. Oh. I really like my. That's a stainless steel Royal Oak. Yeah. But what they did is they put I gold see, bezels. I see, I see. They put gold bezels around the baguettes on a bracelet, and they put a gold bezel on the top. All right. Stainless steel Royal Oak two years ago, Chronograph, how much was it? Uh, it's in high 20s. High 20s. Stainless steel Royal Oak, blue dial, what, it's a brand new, dial. Brand new today. Well, we're, we're actually post the new AP price increase again, three times. Not in, that it matters. Three times in one calendar year. Oh, it, it does matter. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about this. Absolutely matters. Okay, so what is that watch today? 42,000. 42,000. Tomorrow, 43,000. Next watch Next Tuesday, like forty-five thousand. <laughs> so forty-two thousand. So I'm gonna agree yeah. with him with the fact that uh, that watch, the watch itself, has gone up in value. Absolutely. But the fact that it's bust down like that killed it. Killed it. Absolutely. It, it, abso it absolutely killed it. And just because the watch itself went up in value, yes, it went up in value in reference to if he had to go out today buy a stainless steel blue royal oak and have it bust down, it would cost him more because now the dealer that's buying that watch mm -hmm. is paying upwards of forty grand for this damn thing. And instead of let's say twenty eight thirty, so it is going to be ten thousand dollars more. It, the prices of diamonds vary as well, and things of that nature. So yes, theoretically he is right. That watch has gone down in value. If you were to go out and buy one, if somebody brought that to you into the office today, what would you say? I, I wouldn't. I, I just like it's just sad. Three, <laughs> three words. No, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I would say. All Not right, for me. So again, I wish we had Nico. Here. We just did some surgery to it. Added some emeralds. I just really like. I he added emeralds. No. Emerald cuts. He, he meant emerald cuts. So what he did was he, he did some surgery to it and he added... Uh, <laughs> I can't. I'm thinking, so, I'm thinking Nico in the back of my head. Like, I know, what, I know. What, 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 I'm just waiting for him to pop out. What, what the... What, what would Nico say? The first thing I can say, it's absolutely sh**. So, you know, normally they say diamond watches don't hold their value and things like that. But when you get good diamond watches... Diamond watches don't hold their value. Never. Never. Unless it's factory, of course. And a good watch. And even factory ones don't hold their value that well. Uh, because some, I mean, some do, but most don't. Most. Correct. A possibility that it might add value. This watch, see, this was the watch I got when I lost my first watch. So this watch means a lot to me. I don't think I'll ever get rid of this watch, even if I was tired of it. But I lost my Rolex. It's a long story don't want to talk about it. I went to go see my jeweler and I was just, I was devastated. Like I was like upset. Cause it's like, I just threw the money out the window and it's just gone. But I'd be pretty upset. he had that watch right there and I fell in And guess what that watch is? That's the watch Adrian is wearing. And again, 
And I can't. No, that's a gold one. Is that gold? Here no. we go again. No, it's steel. It's steel. Look, Here we go again. look at the bushers. Yeah. This is steel. And I, and I guess it was a yellow dial. No. Let's see. I love with the animals. Somebody I mean? else was supposed to buy them. So what they did was is they bezeled out the diamonds and gold, but the watch is stainless steel. So it's your watch bust down, and I would pay less money for that than I would for that. Absolutely. And the band was originally black, and then I started seeing the watch more often, and I saw that they had different bands, so I got the red camel band. I thought it stood out a little bit more. The so aura strap. This watch, I like it a lot. The rose gold in it, micro pop base setting. It's just a, it's a nice watch, you know. It's not all the way bust down. That is not a micro pop base setting. That is set by hand and not through a microscope. And so it's like if you wearing something casual you could and I know plenty of cats that do that on the street. So with the offshore, I, I told you guys before I'm a big fan of diamond watches and I actually wore uh, the OG Royal Oak Pave dial with the blue mother pearl sub dials. I wore that for a while. I did wear a diamond white gold offshore as well for a while. I can't I can't do it. I wore, not, I, 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 wore, I wore it in my uh, I remember I was in Dubai I rocked it, got it for me when I got tired of it after a day. Just couldn't, yeah. couldn't get down with it. You know, Rolex is a, a classic watch, grown man watch, and I got it in rose gold with the rose. That definitely is a grown man watch. I, I'll agree with that. Um, nah, you know, rose gold. And green, that's the one watch. It's all original. It's a day day two. Two. Rose gold. Which dial I can't tell. Color of gold. I'm not Champagne, really a yellow gold Roman. man. I like you. Champagne Roman dial. One thing I got to tell you about that. And if you want to go back to Russian communities, that's a watch that Russians tend to buy for their wives. That very combination. Still do. And they still do. It's very popular. Joe's wife has yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, who else had, I'm trying to think who else has Well, we're not going to drop any names, but I know at yeah. least three or four wives <laughs> that have that particular watch, and they love it. Mine has, my wife has the 40. She did rock uh, a Day Day 2 in she white did. gold she with did. a diamond dial. Yes. Black diamond dial. Yes. I remember that. She had yeah, that. White gold. That's right. White gold. His wife uh, wears better watches than him. It's, it's very common, so I'm more of a rose gold fan, you know, and I personally don't like bust down Rolexes. Me personally, I like AP's bust down. <laughs> I don't get that. I don't get that at all. <laughs> Honestly, if anything, I like bust down Rolexes better than I do Absolutely. AP's. Yeah. Because because of the shape of the watch, I think it's the way, because Rolex doesn't have those sharp corners, those yeah. octagons and none of that stuff, I think it comes out better if you ask me. Plus, a lot of the Rolexes bust downs are copies of originals, and the originals look good. You know what I mean? Bust down, more, more of my preference on, um, and you know, just a, just a grown man signature piece, like if I'm going out to date with my girlfriend. A grown man signature piece. Grown man signature. I do feel like he's got, I mean, how old is he? How old is he? Uh, he's probably like 18. <laughs> Hey Siri, how long is? <laughs> hey Siri, how old is Robbie Anderson? <laughs> yeah. Robbie Anderson is 27 years. Oh, I sure. mean, he doesn't look a day over 22. I swear yeah. to God, he, he looks good for his age. But listen, he's, he's a professional he's, athlete. He's yeah. a professional athlete. He should. But it, it is a grown man watch. But I think that's an old uh, that's a, that's an old uh, gimmick because uh, you know the president retirement watch type of deal. But I get where he's going with that. Wearing something real casual like a suit or just on a grown man. Wear something casual, casual like, like a, a suit. If there's anything less casual in the suit. So right now he's dressed up. <laughs> because you said something yeah. casual like a suit. That's an oxymoron, I guess. Yeah. And by, by throwing a rose gold rosy and then mixing it in. Actually, with Joe's wife has that exact watch. I had that exact Cartier bracelet. The Cartier bracelet, nothing too major. The Cartier bracelet. So, and then he goes on to yeah. some jewelry and things like that. Okay, well. Again, you know me. I always tell people the same thing. You buy what you buy like. What first you like. He loves his Royal Oaks. Uh, oddly enough, he doesn't like Rolex bust downs, which to me it would be the opposite. If I had to choose a bust down watch, it would be a Rolex bust down watch. I would probably go with the one bust down watch I would probably wear. I'll let you go first. What would be the one bust down watch you would wear? One bust down watch I would wear. I know it's a tough one. Um. Being in the industry, you just know what they do to them, and it's just like I, I, <laughs> I know. But if you had to, like, if I if you had to choose a bust down watch to wear, it's like putting rims on a freaking Bugatti. You know, just don't do that. Um, <laughs> Rolex. Which one? They just, they just just so I know I didn't destroy the watch too bad. <laughs> I you know? would I would probably have the GMT Ice remade, and I've seen those. Oh yeah, I've seen, well, those, yeah, I've seen yeah. those redone. Yeah. Uh, they do them one to one, uh, and uh, if I had to, if I, I actually had to wear, sold, sold a few of them. Yeah, if I had to do that, I would go with the GMT Ice. Normally a $480,000 watch, which you can pick up a lot cheaper if you take a steel yeah, GMT. 
and outfit it with the same way as the factory would do it. Some guys can do it where you can't tell the difference. Of course, they don't sell them as the legit ones, but I've seen I've seen stainless steel GMTs done up as GMT ice, uh, and it's a pretty good job. So that would probably be the it's good because they don't destroy too much. Because it's actually so Rolex. Because with other brands like Paddock, when they do them and they completely ma remanufacture the case and the bracelet, <laughs> and they use some old movement, and it's all of a sudden an Nautilus. It's yeah, it's, it's so, so bad. It's, it's bad. It's, <laughs> bad. it's really really bad. So before we go, real quick, because this is running long as usual. Before we go, thoughts on AP increasing their prices for the third time in a pandemic year? Well, forget the pandemic. Three years, three times they increased their. This last, this did it. Did it take effect yet? The seven percent. Yes. When it was last week? On the fifth. On the fifth. Yes. So uh, that was three days ago. Uh, three days ago. Yeah. So and I got hit f funny. Funny you say that. Um, I was trying to. <laughs> I was trying to buy a watch last week. Uh, Royal Oak fifteen five hundred. That's the black tile. So I made a client of ours an offer on the watch and like pretty much was a done deal. And then I guess he walks into an AP boutique, his local AP boutique, wherever he's from, and he was looking at another watch and they had mentioned that they re raise the retails. Well, there goes that purchase. So, make a long story short. Did you give him more money? Uh, no, I consigned it. Okay. I have thirty days to sell it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's the agreement. All right, cool. Uh, so, so, th but general thoughts on AP raising their prices so three times in the last year. It's a, it's a, if if they can, if they can do it, do it. Take Why my not? hat off to them. Take my hat off to them. And really, it's a here's and move. here and I think here's what's happening is. They're not stupid. They're seeing what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. They're seeing the hype on their watches. And note that, look, let's let's take a biggest disparity in a Royal Oak a retail versus sales sales price. It'd probably be the fifteen two hundred two. Fifteen two hundred two. Okay, so the fifteen two hundred two blue dial retail is what thirty eight. Um, no. No. Well, I can tell See, you. at this point, it's so bad. The market has gotten so bad that we don't even remember retail. I used to be able to spit out any retail price off the top of my head, but because we don't deal with retails anymore, because some of these people pieces are just simply market price, and there's so much over retail where the retail is irrelevant, we don't remember. What you got? 15202, 15, And Adrian happens to have prices handy in his phone, of course. What is 15202? Don't tell me they they discontinued or something. Why is it not on his price list? <gasps> no. I'm about to be like my daughter. ORs. I'm about to be like my daughter's favorite cartoon, Octonauts. Alert, 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 alert. <laughs> wow. Okay, I don't see it on his price list. Uh, approximately. It's got to be it's got to be around a 30,000 mark. Okay, so let's point. say retail's 30,000 market price is what? Twenty okay exactly so at, on the AP website it's showing twenty eight nine which I do believe was a price increase. Um, market okay, so price, let's call it thirty thousand dollars. Sixty thousand now. Okay, market is not let's say sixty thousand. So it's, it's double. double. Yeah, it's double. It is price so the most premium. No, it's, it's not the most what, premium. What's it twenty nine eight? Yeah, the most premium Royal Oak out there is probably the ceramic perpetual. Oh, we're, we're getting. Yeah, we're getting we're getting up there. So twenty nine eight. I'm gonna take away. What is it? Twenty eight nine. So twenty eight nine. I'm gonna take away seven percent times point nine three. So, whoops, not times. Twenty-eight nine times point nine three. So the last retail price was twenty-six and change, right? Yeah. So note right. what AP didn't do is say, well, wait a minute, these watches are selling for fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Let's make the retail forty. No. Because they know they're gonna kill it. Yeah. So they're not getting greedy. Slowly but surely, they're doing mm -hmm. these price increases. Now, there's also a happy medium there because look, three price increases in the year, people take note of that. So they're but they're probably adjusting for <laughs> inflation. I would I would rather see them do one price increase and bigger. I, I you know instead of going slowly from twenty three to twenty nine or whatever it may have been, I would probably just have them jump to thirty and call it a day. You know, and the market won't shift. Won't, the market won't suffer because of that because they're still up there for so much money. But don't be surprised if we see at least another two increases this year. Probably if the market we'll keeps going the way. See what happens uh, globally. You know. Anyway, always yep. a pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Guys, always a pleasure having you. Thank you once again for tuning in to Watches and Whiskey. As always, subscribe button, like button, the bell, what else is there? Share button, all, hit, hit all those buttons because that, because that helps the show. And if you don't follow me, follow me at VIP Vault, and Ian will put my email down in case you guys have any questions. Have anything to sell. This is a great time to sell. So, Adrian at LuxuryBazaar.com. And of course, Ian wouldn't be Adrian if you wouldn't put that pitch out there. But as he said, do follow him on the gram. Email him for any questions. You guys know where to email me, Roman Sharp at luxurybazaar.com, Adrian at luxurybazaar.com. And we'll see you guys on our next Watches and Whiskeys. Cheers. Cheers.